good morning, everybody. Um, this is the Ask a Painter live show. It is a dreary, drizzling day in Minnesota. We've had our false spring a month ago, and now we're back to sort of like cold, dreary uh, weather again. And it is what it is, right? So we live from, we live in Minnesota, and uh, it kind of is what it is. So uh, this is the Ask a Painter live show. I am Nick Slavic. I'm the proprietor of the Nick Slavic Painting Restoration Company. I'm also the host of this show, Ask a Painter Live. It's a weekly live Facebook show where I use my almost three decades of experience as a craftsperson and a uh, business owner to answer any questions. And if I don't have the answers, the people that are attached to this show and in this community do. It's a, it's a very thoughtful group of people and I'm very glad to be, uh, be among my peers with this stuff. So uh, today we're gonna be talking about the four day work week. I work four days a week and so does everybody else in my company. Now there's some asterisks, there's some caveats, there's some things like that, but any questions that you guys want to ask, there's always the same three or four questions that everybody asks about the four day work week. Definitely ask them here. This is it. Now, we're also going to answer any questions you guys have about anything else. So again, this is the Ask a Painter live show. I'm going to talk to you about the theory of the four day work week, how it actually works, the practicality of it. I'm going to show you how I block schedule my calendar and the calendars of the people in my leadership team and company so that we can maximize our work, maximize our family time and the rest of that. So again, this is all based on the principles of first principle reasoning. Uh, first principle reasoning is something we'll get into in a little bit, uh, but thoughts, deep thoughts, big thoughts like that are shared commonly among members of the PCA, the Painting Contractors Association. So I am a member. Um, most of the things that I am doing in my business now are not original. They're cherry picked from people across all industries, but mainly a lot of big thinkers in our industry. I just enact them and put them together in a different way. So if you're interested in more thoughts like this, novel ideas of having 50% more time for uh, on the weekends with your families and friends and, uh, you know, four day work weeks, things like that. This is what people in the PCA think about. We're thinking about new and innovative ways to change and professionalize the trades right now, folks. Honestly, it is the wild west out there in the trades. Um, you hear me talk about the American dream and stuff like that. Um, if you want to, let's assume the American dream is creating something from nothing, creating freedom, whatever you consider that for you and your family and your friends and people around you and having the ability to do and to not do things at your whim in the future and have the freedom to have choices and, uh, and be able to alter your own life in a very novel way. If you want to talk about the American dream, I don't know that you can get a better example than the trades right now. Um, the trades are largely made up of the generation above me, my father's generation of tradespeople. They are very good. They are mostly very thoughtful. They're not doing a great job of recruiting, may or may not be their fault. And they are exiting the trades at an alarming rate. I heard a colleague of mine say that there's 10,000 a day leaving the trades in the United States and not many people are there to replace them. So. What's interesting now is these are jobs that take a lot of skill, a lot of thought, a lot of patience, and there's not many people backfilling in order to do them. So right now, if you start up a trades company and you answer your phone, you will be overwhelmed with work. You can't do that with a bank. If you want to create an example of the American dream and you want to create freedom for yourself, it's going to be very difficult for you to start up a bank and do that. Uh, with a vehicle, which you probably own, and a stepladder, which you probably own, and uh, a couple bucks to buy a can of paint and some brushes and some drop cloths, you can start up a paint company and create your own little American dream. So what it doesn't take is a whole bunch of startup money, equity, capital, things like that. What it does take is grit if you wanna do it right. So dig in, this is the American dream, folks. Um, all it takes is consistency, perseverance, grit, and the slightest bit of thought and answer your phone and you'll be overwhelmed with work. So this is a wonderful thing. Uh, now let's get into the, oh man. Oh, Jason the painter from Minneapolis. <laughs> so last, uh, yesterday, uh, Jason, Jason Miller, uh, everybody knows him, Jason the painter, the famous guy from Instagram, a uh, close friend of mine in the industry and close friend uh, outside of the industry came down here to the uh, Slavic farm, Slavic house, Slavic shop. We did the tour, everything else. And it was uh, awesome. I love Jason. He is a big thinker. He's an influencer in all the right ways. 
And uh, I love following him on Instagram. If you guys don't, I would definitely do that. But we had a wide ranging conversation. Uh, we toured my shop. We toured the war room. We looked through my house. We looked through the, the, the Slavic farm and we went down to our local uh, Giesenbrau uh, brew pub down there uh, where we have happy hour. And uh, as coincidence would have it, Estimator Andy, the beloved Estimator Andy was down there as well, getting some food for his family. So we all grabbed a homemade beer and uh, yeah, just sat there and uh, it was a great time. So thank you for the conversation, Jason. And I, I never get sick of that. Let's do it again. So, um, okay, folks. Let's get into this. Drop all of your questions down below in the comments about the four-day work week here. I'll give you some perspective and then just ask away. Um, a lot of people love to poke holes in this stuff, uh, but I find it uh, a fun sort of experiment like this. So, all right. The four-day work week. This is something based on first principle reasoning. First principle reasoning is something that I was introduced to a couple years ago. Um, the most famous practitioner of um, first principle reasoning would probably be Elon Musk. And I am, I am very uh, hesitant to, to mention his name in this podcast because I would never draw a line between me and him and even draw it close. But what he did was he's a, he's a big problem solver. And what he did was he wants to shoot a rocket into space. And everybody around him says that costs $300 million because that's what it does cost right now. And only the government of Russia and only the government of the United States can do it. So it's impossible. It's spendy. You can't do it. It's just fraught with disaster. What are you going to do? And he got out a scratch pad and said, well, let's let's think about first principles. First principle reasoning is taking a problem, breaking it down to the fundamental truths, looking at those truths, getting rid of your assumptions, assumptions and head trash and building up from there. So basically, he said, well, listen, as far as I can tell, it only costs about two or three million bucks to buy the parts you need for a rocket. So where, why is there $296 million added onto this? And that's first principle reasoning. He's looking at this thing. Everybody else says it can't be done. The common thinking is, well, you got to be a major government to do this. And he's like, well, I don't know. As far as I can tell, I can get these for cheap. Let's start solving the problem. Same thing goes with a lot of things that I do in my business, which is, you know, hey, there's no good people out there. Things like that. Well, what is the actual problem? There are humans out there. And in fact, there's 96 million millennials, which is bigger than the baby boom generation out there. So when somebody says there's no good people, 96 million people between 20 and 40, give or take out there, you can't find one. The problem is not that we get rid of assumptions, we get rid of head trash and we say, okay, there are humans out there. Now, what do we have to do with them? When people say there's no good people out there, they're saying there's nobody I can plug into my business that will do everything I want them to do without any teaching. And they'll not just they, they won't just do it without asking me anything and then stay forever. So the first principle reasoning part of that is, okay, there are people out there, but you got to approach it differently. You maybe have to make them your own in your own apprenticeship program, something like that. Same thing with work days. Why do we work five days a week? Because we always have. Like every time somebody says we've always done it this way, that to me, it's like a dog whistle to me for this might be able to be reformed and, and reformed in a big way. So when somebody says, well, you always work, it's eight, it's eight hours a day or eight and a half hours a day. You take a half hour off for lunch and then you work Monday through Friday. I don't know. It seems to me like there's a whole bunch of hours in a day. There's three eight hour days in every day. Typically, people will sleep for eight, work for eight, and then kind of, you know, really productive people will use that eight for something, a business or family. And a lot of people waste that third eight. Uh, they kind of do it unintentionally like that. So the first principle reasoning is, well, why can't you work four days a week? Just add another two hours to each day and work your 40 hours a week. And yes, it only adds two hours a day. Like, yes, you have to get up a little earlier, maybe, unless you're a, early, a morning person like me. You may have to work an hour later, maybe, I don't know. But then you compress your time. I'm interested in time compression. I would much rather take 40 hours and put it into three or four days than in five days because then you can have an entire day where you don't have to think about business if you want. You don't have to check in if you're an employee and you can spend that compressed time with your family. And that's very important to me. Let's, I'm going to catch up with questions before we get there. Oh, yeah. Uh, Cincy Haas painting. How do you structure your family life around the 10 to 12 hour day during that four day period? So here's the question from Instagram. So the difference, how I make this work is having very strict um, 
sort of boundaries around family time and things like that. Um, I, I'm going to be very honest with you guys. I make up for all the time that I need to do stuff early morning. I'm an early morning person. I'm up at four every day and between four and six every day, I get most of my work done that I need to for the day. Anything that was sort of lingering from the last day, setting all the uh, you know foundation for, for success for the day is all done between four and six in the morning. Just super productive time, logged in. I got my cup of coffee. The lights are dim. We got music playing and it's just go, go, go produce. Um, and then uh, I usually head out during the day. I'll share my schedule with you. And then usually at about five o'clock, I'm done for the day. Um, and normally what happens is commonly what I see people do is they don't want to get up early for this. They'll get up right before they need to, they go to work. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff left over at the end of the day. And that's the thing that cuts into family time. Um, interestingly enough, when you look at my schedule, even though I probably put in an enormous amount of hours during the week, what I do is I, I take from the third eight in my day. So if you sleep for eight hours, work for eight hours, you have another eight hours during a 24 hour period where you can choose what to do with it. A lot of people are very unintentional about this. I choose to, to parse that time out four hours for, uh, physical fitness and business and four hours for family. Uh, very strict sort of time uh, management with that stuff. A lot of people will not do that. They will sleep in, they will do something else. They will kind of frivol, they'll be frivolous with that time. And then they they use their family time in the evening to cut into business. So that's probably the biggest difference that I uh, do with that sort of thing. Um, also, if if you feel like you're working a little bit longer hours, for me, I would rather have three complete days with my family or, you know, a, of that than an extra hour a night because you get home, you're usually tired. There's things lingering. Sometimes you're still checking emails, things like that. I like to compress my time. And for my personality, I like to do something or not do something like a light switch sort of thing. If I'm working, I like to work. I like to put my head down, be super productive because if I'm going to spend time away from family and other stuff, I want it to be productive. And likewise with my family. If I'm going to spend time with my family, I want to hit that switch and say, I'm not thinking about business and it is just family. So time compression, things like that. Let's go through a couple more IG. All right. Facebook. Let's see what we got here for some questions. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Joran from the Netherlands. Oh, Greg Andreas finally made a live show. Good morning. Scotty Frame, do the guys take vans home? Tracking devices on vans. No tracking devices on vans. Um, uh, painters don't take vans home. A uh, leadership team does. So they negotiate that part of their salary. What's your approach to the four-day work week if jobs don't pan out to be 40 hours in four days? Maybe a job gets done early one day and dry time stalls you. So this is a very common thing. Everybody says, well, what happens if you do this? What happens if you do this? Everybody runs into the same things working a five-day week as they do a four-day week in 40 hours. If that job was going to get a weird point at the end of 40 hours working five days, it's still going to get it working four days. So what we do is we're very strict with our scheduling. We have two people in the business, Justin and Holly, who are production managers and client concierges that spend an enormous amount of time scheduling so that we maximize every single hour. They have A plans, B plans, C plans, contingency plans, everything for everybody. We have a very strict reporting system in my company. So we're getting multiple updates throughout the day from our people so that we can track their projects so that we can see a stoppage coming up and send them somewhere else or find something else for them to do on the job site as well. So it, it just takes a lot of human interaction. Jonathan LaFontaine, what about production after eight hours? We see no difference in that. Honestly, it's one of those things where I've I've built my life uh, back in uh, back in a different version of this business. We used to work 6 a.m. to 4 p.m., uh, mainly on exteriors, things like that. And I didn't see anybody drop off after that time. Um, it's not something that I can tell. If it is happening in my company, you certainly can't tell from the numbers. So, all right, Brian Sharp, what time do you go to bed? Uh, I try to hit the hay about 9 p.m. every day. How do you dress longer days in interior projects when clients may not want you in their house? until 6 p.m. So we are not in houses till 6 p.m. We start at 7 a.m. and we work to 5 p.m. Monday through Thursday. We've been doing this for almost two years now. And uh, all the things that people think of as sort of like, there's a lot of head trash around a four day work week. Like what happens when nobody's there on Friday? What happens if, you know, you're, will people let you in at seven? Yes, absolutely they will. I, I had the similar head trash with estimates. Years ago, I was like, oh, wow. 9 p.m. Sunday night. Of course, I'll be there for an estimate because if that if you mention that time, I'll be there. 
And you, I used to think that everybody couldn't get away from their job during the week to do estimates. Turns out everybody can get away from their job. So we do estimates during the day, during specific times. And you, I thought, well, there's no way anybody could break away and do an estimate. Turns out everybody can. So I had a whole bunch of head trash about this. Similar head trash about, well, are people going to let you in your house at seven? Maybe. We're going to get the, we're very upfront and honest uh, with our clients about, about our schedules. And we're very, we're very specific about, we go seven to five, Monday through Thursday. We get the same amount of work done as somebody who's going to be in your house five days a week. But we do that so our people can spend more time with their families. It's a compressed bit of time. So instead of dealing with us for five days of the week inside your house, you're only dealing with us for four, things like that. So how do you dress long? Oh, there we go. Great perspective. Uh, no problem. Do you have some who don't want to work for tens? So Mitchell Fahey. So this is part of the onboarding of the company. If this isn't interesting to you, find another job. This is what we do. It's very specific. We cannot customize a job for every single person out there. If you want to be a part of what we're doing, our culture, our business, reforming the trades, doing insanely good work, winning national awards for our work, having health insurance, retirement, paid time off, being your own boss, practicing this craft, having a finishing facility, training facility, leadership team to support you, that's what it costs. And most people see it as an insane benefit because first principle reasoning when you take a step back is if you work a four day work week as an employee, you have 50% more time off than anybody else you know. You're taking a two day weekend, turning it into three. Find me other people who have a three day weekend every week for their entire life. When you take another step back, you realize I'm only asking about 16 days a month. On average, you have between 13 and 15 other days in the month to do whatever you want with. That feels good. That feels really good. Typically, there is 261 working days in a year with a four-day work week. I think it's 210, 218, something in there. That is not a lot to ask. So, yes, you might have to wake up a little earlier unless you wake up that time anyway. You may have to spend a little bit later time at work. Maybe, maybe not. Bankers work till five. We work till five. The trade-off that you get is a compressed time, more time with your family, 50% more time off. Mm, da, 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 da. Let's see. I start to get tired around two, but I'm lazy, Jonathan. That's funny. Uh, Kevin Hayes, so you pay your guys for lunch. Yes. So this is another interesting benefit uh, of what we do. So everybody gets a half an hour paid lunch. That's the equivalent of about 110 hours of paid time a year that they normally wouldn't be paid for. So that is a lot of time. Uh, with exterior season near, what happens when the Minnesota weather doesn't cooperate? Uh, would it be rare to bust out a job on a Saturday? Ah, yes. So that's the other question everybody asks. So what happens when you work Monday through Thursday and Monday gets rained out? The common refrain is, listen, we may have to work a Friday. That is what it is. And we brief our people. I brief the entire company that basically says, listen, we may have to work a Friday. I want you guys to know what's out there. I but we're really good at not doing it. Um, we've been doing this for almost two years. In 2019, I believe we altered the four-day work week one or two times, uh, not even for the whole company, just partially. Um, in 2020, we did not force a Friday at all. So you can say, I mean, it feels like you would have to do it all the time, but in practice, if you spend a lot of time scheduling, making contingency plans, things like that, you can keep it to Monday through Thursday if you really want to. But it would be good to be realistic with your team and say, listen, if, it, if we don't have an interior job for you to go to, let's say you have a one crew company. It's you and maybe two helpers and you guys are on a big exterior. If you don't have an interior lined up, you should probably be honest with them and say, listen, if we get rained out Monday and Tuesday, we're going to have to go Wednesday through Friday uh, and maybe even Saturday. Now, in Minnesota uh, employment law, you can force overtime. You can have mandatory overtime. I have never done it in the 14 years of owning my business. Um, there may be a time for it in the future, but that's not a morale builder and that's not a culture builder. Uh, it's way better to get people uh, to select into overtime than it is to force them into overtime, things like that. So, all right, let's see here. Jonathan LaFontaine, painting is all over the place. You're Nick, if your work days uh, make 10 hours, you need the three day weekend, <laughs> sort of. In my company, we work seven and a half hours a day, five days a week. Nice. Scotty Frayne, what do you say to employees that want to moonlight jobs on their off days? Fine. 
It is a free country. You cannot sign non-compete clause. Well, you can have somebody uh, sign non-compete, but they won't hold up. And again, we're trying to build a culture where if somebody wants to do work on the side, that's fine. I'm definitely not going to stop them. I will certainly make an argument that if, if you're being paid $25 an hour in my company and you want to work overtime, anything over 40 is overtime, you're going to be paid time and a half. So that's the equivalent of almost $40 an hour. Uh, for working uh, for this company on a Friday, a Saturday, or a Sunday. So I would say if you're going to do side work, you don't have any of the professional tools. You don't have any of the things that we have. If you get hurt on a side job, it is not work comp. That is outside of the realm of business. You are not punched in and you can't get unemployment for that, uh, at least not through my company. So if you were to break your leg and you're out for six months, that's not work comp. Uh, through my company. If you get hurt on one of my job sites doing work for our company, yes, you have the full force of uh, benefits behind you, uh, me and the uh, state and federal government to assist you. But And then there's the whole, uh, you're basically going to business for yourself, which is clients can choose not to pay you as well. So it's not guaranteed. So I would make a great argument that you know, you're working towards something in the company. We have jobs for you. We can pay you an enormous amount of money for that time if you want to. I certainly understand if you want to do something else. But again, I'll make a good argument that this is the way to go. So let's see what else we got here. You let people work overtime when they want. So overtime, a couple things that you have to do. You have to be able to do all our work to standards under budget. Uh, it has to be a job where the client is okay with it as well. Uh, we normally don't work Saturdays and Sundays. A lot of times we do have uh, a couple of people work uh, at least half days every Friday, give or take. Uh, there's always something to do around here. If somebody wants, we almost never turn them down for overtime uh, if they can do that. So do, 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 do. let's see here. All right. So one thing I want to talk about with you guys is um, economies of scale too. So on a four day work week, Typically, you have, you know, you drive to work only four times instead of five. So again, when you're taking a step back from this whole thing, if you have a half an hour commute, you're going to make 10 commutes on a five day work week. You're going to make eight commutes on a four day work week. So again, you're already building in a little bit extra time. Lunches as well. There are only four lunches that you have to pay for as a business owner or not pay for instead of five. All this time is just compressing or all this stuff is just compressing time. Um, also, this allows you to sort of alter your, your personal life. Spouses of people who work in a four-day work week can alter their schedule so that there's more advantageous uh, job opportunities, uh, more time together. I know there's at least one uh, couple in my company who, who both have four-day work weeks and they both get three-day weekends together. So it's a really interesting thing. Uh, family and work separation goes deeper even into communication. Four-day work week compresses time and creates a little more separation. Uh, we also use an app called Slack. So we're not just sending group tech messages. We're not calling people on the regular phones. It's an app where if you want to communicate with the company, you can hit the app and it shows up and you can communicate. If you are not punched in, you do not want to communicate with the company Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, you do not open the app and it'll be for you uh, there Sunday night or Monday morning when you want to check in and, and see what the week has for you. So it's a very sort of like, we take it very seriously here. And yes, we send messages, we send emails, after hours, whatever, but certainly we we have an expectation in the company where you don't have to, you know, it's Friday night at nine o'clock. If somebody sends you a message, you don't necessarily have to be on it right away. So just one of those things. So um, leadership team. So here's... Here's the rhythm that we've found over a while. Um, we are in a aggressive building mode in this business. So it's kind of all hands in. Uh, the leadership team puts in at least a half a day Friday every week. And it's really beneficial for us. Estimator Andy still goes out there and does a couple estimates. He's got some decompression time. He's got time to sift through the week, make sure all his paperwork and everything is order. Uh, Dominic, how's it going, man? And, and then prepare for the next week. And then Andy still gets, estimator Andy still gets at least a half day with his family every Friday as well. Uh, I'll share with you my calendar here uh, after we go through a little bit of this. The production team, Justin and Holly, uh, they really value their Friday mornings because there's no painters working typically. And what they will do is go through and uninterrupted work, um, do all the things that they need to from the week that maybe didn't get done. They prepare all the uh, reports, the job costing and everything for the next week. They line up jobs. They communicate with clients. And typically, we have we have such a decent human being culture here that 
we really don't check in on each other like that. I know that Justin and Holly and Andy put in way more work than our standard sort of hours and things like that. I see when they're messaging early. I see when they're messaging late. I see them tending to this stuff all over the weekend, but there's not an expectation where we're checking on somebody like, hey, it's it's 10 a.m. on a Friday. Are you at work? It's like, no, you know what? If they get their work done and there's nothing to do on a Friday, good. That's what we're planning to do. I say we're in aggressive growth mode in this company because it does require a lot of effort. It requires a lot of early mornings from me. It requires early and early mornings from them. It requires Friday work. The eventual goal of this company is basically to have everybody on a four day work week and we'll get there. It's there, but there's building to be done in the time. And I'm really happy that I get to build this business with those people here. So, all right. And then me. Um, so what's great is we talk about freedom all the time. I have the freedom to work or not work Friday, which is great. Typically, there's no painters in the field that need anything. Uh, the leadership team, we usually communicate back and forth a little bit. Um, I choose to work a half day Friday mornings uh, because it's different feeling when you can choose to work to end or not to work. And typically, I do something called ideation, which is uh, Friday mornings for me is the is the insanely fun work day. Like I look forward to everything during the week, but Friday mornings are for me. I get to do my pet projects. I like to do the ideation, the visioning, the things where you're looking forward. I go through budgets. I go through all the financials. I'm looking for trends and patterns and things like that so that I can call things out as we need to and make adjustments to the company on a large scale. Friday mornings for me are take four steps back, take a look at the company, and what am I seeing? Sniff test it. Sometimes we get so granular and we get so deep into it. We're talking about the percentage of thinner that goes into a primer to create the greatest finish. We're talking about a special brush. We're talking about a special way of cleaning, a way of organizing a shop. The leaders of the companies, the owners need to take a step back and start looking for overall patterns. How many hours on average are people working? What do we feel like the culture is of the company? If there is friction points, what are they? You need to be looking down the road a little bit to anticipate things so you can be building systems and processes to uh, stop a lot of the stuff that happens normally. So we'll get to another couple of questions here uh, in a second. But yeah, typically I punch out then on noon. I used to do the Ask a Painter live show at noon on Friday. That was kind of the end of my work week. But now since we moved it to uh, Saturday, Fridays are a beautiful day for me. I usually sit at my desk a little bit longer in the morning uh, and then go on with my day. And it's uh, it's kind of a wonderful thing. So let's see how, uh, let's see a couple questions here. Does your crew get PTO vacation days? Yes. Everybody over a year uh, gets PTO. Uh, you got to stick with me for a year. Michael Crane, how's it going, man? Good to see you. Good morning, sunshine to you as well. <sighs> Scotty Frane, what's your 2021 goal and how's it looking so far? Uh, so I have... I feel like, so I always feel like we underperform, um, but I have high expectations for everybody in this company. My people are doing insanely well right now. Um, we are on track to meet our goal. Uh, the only difference is I'm trying to, trying to figure out how to put this succinctly. Like there's, a, there's, there's an easy goals to put your hands around like revenue production. There's other goals that I give the leadership team. We call rocks because we're followers of traction every quarter. The first quarter, um, we take the thing that, well, we call it on fire, but really that's, that's, a, that's a negative way of putting it. We take the biggest friction point in the company and together as a team, we solve it. Quarter one rock for my production team was solving color consultation and design advice. And we had uh, typically, well, we had Sherwin do our color consults forever and they went 100% virtual. And it turns out none of our clients wanted virtual color consults. So we scrambled, we found a whole bunch of really good designers. We got them in with our systems and they're out there doing it. So production team, huzzah, rock number one, quarter one, solved it. That took a friction point out of our business. Uh, rock number two is, uh, is recruiting, onboarding, and getting subcontractors on with us because we have an enormous amount of work and we're doing that right now. And uh, so far that goal is probably 90% complete uh, for quarter two. Quarter three, we're gonna start up uh, recruiting for the apprenticeship program again. And then quarter four, we're going into fine, fine stability, things like that. Uh, quarter three and quarter four rocks, the big goals for the production team and me are a little bit different. Um, and they change. I only usually give one rock, one rock ahead in there because things change as you get in there. So 
Uh, typically, rocks for me are <clears throat> I have to take a couple steps back and I have to maintain the health of this company, maintain the culture of the company, and then keep looking forward like that. And we do a lot of these things like four day work weeks, happy hours. I go to boss lunch every Thursday. I, me and the leadership team meet one of our crews on a site and have lunch together. I do site visits. We're mentoring people on their goals. Everybody in this company has a goal. Every painter has a goal that we laid out in their goal setting and review meeting. And we kind of actively help out with that thing and uh, get them going. Um, Estimator Andy's goals for quarter one was to fine tune our sales reporting system. And he did that masterfully. Now, either quarter two or quarter three, we're ironing out friction points. And then we're probably going to be recruiting another estimator and salesperson for the company. And he will be deputized to train and inculcate that person into the culture of the company. So that's coming shortly. For me, uh, it's basically just looking down the line and making sure that the health of the company is good. So we'll go through a couple more questions and then we'll go through, uh, I'll share my calendar with you here. Ding, de, 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 de. Oh, Paul Gerald, how's it going? The shop I, I work at does four and a half days, half day on Fridays that allows for banking. Yes, appointments, auto service. Absolutely, Paul. That's one of the things that we do too, which is it's always awkward to have to like, oh, I need to go do this. I need to go this. If you have a whole day Friday to do that stuff, it's great. You can get all that stuff done. So uh, Phil Klein, attendance policy. What's calling procedures look like? How many days missed a month before you implement a plan? So we have the standards in my company and it's do this and you keep your job. Typically, I like to have people miss no more than two days a quarter. That's about two weeks off a year, give or take. If you do that, that doesn't seem like a lot of time, but if you work 40 hours a week for 50 weeks, that's 2000 hours a year. That's the basic minimum of how businesses are structured. Uh, 2000 hours a year per employee in order to produce the revenue we need to pay for health insurance, retirement, paid time off, shop, vehicles, uh, happy hours, boss lunches, things like that. So um, I do not, I mean, listen, this goes without saying, there's health issues, there's family issues, there's child childcare issues. There are weddings, there's vacations, there's things like that. I don't hold it against anybody. The people who want to master this will magically find themselves doing more than 2,000 hours a year and still have all the time for that stuff. So that's a that's just a self-evident truth here. Yoren, ah, it's 3.25 in the afternoon here, just listening to you <laughs> doing estimates. Oh, I love it, Yoren. You got to send me some pictures of some stuff you're working on. I bet you got some cool projects over there. Seth, good morning. Uh, let's see, Scotty. Da, 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 da. Oh, here we go. Ryan Gill. Hey, buddy. Can't wait for July. Same. Uh, followers attraction. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for the live shows. <laughs> so many companies would never be open. Listen, man, uh, I was very fortunate enough to, to have a lot of people share things with me and I would be selfish and greedy to not pass those along as well because it legitimately has changed my life. So, all right, uh, Kevin Hayes, I have me plus three employees. Is there a way you could suggest to ease into four day work week or just go straight into it? The best thing you could do is do an experiment. So, and get your team involved with this. Say, hey guys, I got an idea. Number one, what do you guys think about a four day work week? What do you guys think about having 50% more time off? And you'll probably get a lot of questions, the same questions that come up here. And you say, hey guys, here we go. Two weeks from now, we're gonna try it for one week. We're going to go 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Thursday. Let's give it a good experiment. Let's have everybody show up. Let's all hands on deck. And at the end of it, we're going to have a little meeting and we're going to go over the friction points. What worked well? What didn't? What would you change? Is this something we want to do? And just give somebody an experiment. You don't have to completely retool your company. Just say for one week, we're going to give it a try. Let's do it together. and Let's see what we think and get some feedback. And if you include them in it, they will not, um, if they bristle at the, at the, Thing, uh, at the idea of a four-day work week. If you include them in it, they're going to take a little bit of ownership in that. Let them guide the process. It's very simple. I mean, the 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 um, <laughs> the uh, uh, the value proposition is basically, hey, you want an extra day off every week and still get paid the same? Like that's that's intriguing to me and a lot of other people. So, <laughs> oh, let's see here. Da, 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 da. Did the shutdown affect your business, uh, Jonathan Lafontaine? Uh, it depends what shut down, but yeah, 2020 we saw two periods uh, of, uh, of stuff, weird stuff going on in our company. I initially let in the spring of 2020, uh, I let everybody decide whether they wanted to self quarantine or not, because I didn't know what this thing was. Nobody did. So it's better to just say, what do you want to do for yourself and your family and your safety? Just do that. And then uh, there was a assumed, um, da, 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 there was an assumed COVID test 
positive test in my company in the fall. And again, we can't ask for that test. We can't prove it. But for the safety of my company, I shut it down for two weeks, paid everybody, and we moved on from there. So it is what it is. Jonathan LaFontaine, what about drive time? Uh, drive time is not paid in my company, except if you're going between job sites or if you do a substantial amount of work, material work, and then drive somewhere. It's a pretty simple policy, uh, industry standard. Let's go through some in IG. Oh, yeah, here we go. All right, everybody. <laughs> oh, love the comments. Thanks, guys. I appreciate this. Then we'll share my calendar finally. Any advice for a guy that works for himself uh, and that want to add unique painters to the business? How do you go about that? Just a quick brief. Yeah, Dominic, I'm always happy to help if you email me, nick at nickslavic.com. We can sh share some uh, deep thoughts together. But basically, you got to find people that uh, typically are not in the industry and uh, just look for decency, human decency. Look for optimism, happiness, and low mass personal chaos. You, you, if you can suss out mass personal chaos, um, people, you want people that are consistent, share your core values, and you want to be very clear with them up front about what you expect. So you're going to need clear deliverables for your business, and that's going to set it up the most. And how these people react to those deliverables will kind of determine how successful they're going to be uh, in your business. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. What else we got here? Is word of mouth still the gold standard of advertising? Is there another more effective form to invest in? Ask because the first couple of years and the vast majority of my work has been repeat customers. Yes, Wild Acres Construction, that is the best. If if you could, if I could only do business from word of mouth, that they're not only are they already vetted clients normally, it doesn't cost anything. Now that's a dream. You can word of mouth and referrals will only get you so far. Uh, for every million dollars of painting business that we do, typically half a million of that comes from repeat customers, referral, word of mouth, and the other half a million I need to like pay for and sort of make it happen. So um, at least in my area, I found a couple things where uh, typically I've tried, I mean, I've tried Instagram, Facebook, I've done all the things, you know, even newspaper ads, radio ads, things like that. Typically right now, I don't want it to work, but direct mail does very well. Now it's expensive and you got to maintain it and you got to put some thought into it, but honestly, it still works. So uh, I would at least look into that. Happy to share some more. Uh, yeah, I would happy to share some more thoughts with you. I've done all the experiments. I have all the data and uh, yeah, it's very market specific to me and my business, but it is what it is. So do you have guys on site or 7 a.m. at the shop? Paint school, 7 a.m. start time at, uh, at the site. We go seven to five actually painting unless there's shop work to be done. Okay, so typically this is, I'm gonna show you how I block schedule in order to maintain efficiency here. And I'll get my big head out of there like this. All right, so this is a typical week um, uh, that my schedule, uh, Google Calendar is a beautiful thing. What you're gonna see is uh, I like to compress time. I like, if I do something, I like to do it and not mix in a lot of other stuff together. So what you'll see uh, from 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. every day, that gray block is catch up. Um, that's basically, as the business owner, um, what I see, what I've learned over the last 10 years is that you need to have unscheduled time and not unscheduled time, but you have to schedule time and not fill it with things so that it will be filled by just running a business. Um, typically, if I had to give advice to business owners who are feeling the stress of there's so much to be done, there's so many emails, so many calls, so many things to do, schedule at least a half day every day of reaction time. There's going to be things that come up. If you schedule estimates from eight in the morning to six at night with only drive time in between, no time to react, everything that happens during the day, you're not going to be able to react to, and you're already going to be a half day behind the next day. So it is painful, but I found for the volume of business we do, the amount of people we employ, a half day for me is pretty good. There's, there's tactical things that I need to do to assist in the growth and the prosperity of this business. And those are like, must be done. So things don't catch on fire or regress. Half day should really be unscheduled because there are many, many things that come up that you need to react to. So um, typically four to 6 a.m. I catch up. I just sit at my desk. It's dark. It's quiet. I got EDM music playing. Uh, lights are low. I got the cup of coffee and I just go as fast as my fingers can move. I just do stuff. I get in my email. I use my email as my to do list. I leave reminders in there and I just start at the top and I go do, 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 just knock out as much stuff as I can. I used to do fitness stuff uh, earlier in the morning, but 
my mind would be thinking about all the things that I have to do. And I wouldn't, I would be very anxious and I wouldn't be into whatever I'm doing. So typically what I do then from four to six catch up from six to eight. Now I do fitness. So I'll do some uh, weight training and then I'll go for a five mile walk. And that's sort of an ideation period. I've done a whole bunch of catch up work. I have some things on my uh, plate that I need to do during that five mile walk. It's about an hour and 10 minutes. That's ideation time where I can start sorting the thoughts in my head. What are the big things I need to think about? What are the patterns in the company that I need to uh, look for? What are, what are going to be the opportunities in the future? What are going to be some uh, threats in the future? Things like that. And I start organizing my day and I start putting together a list of priorities. Okay. What do I need to do first? What is the biggest opportunity? What is the thing that I can use my time most valuable for? And I'm already putting that list together mentally in my head uh, as I go there. Monday mornings at 8 a.m., I will check in with shop manager Brandon, see how he's doing. He's got some big personal goals that we've been working on too, and some mentorship. And so we're going through that. We're checking on the shop. We're looking for patterns. We're seeing how things are going. We're getting the whole spray facility hooked up. So that's normally a thing. At 9 a.m., I meet with estimator Andy, and we have our sales meeting where we just talk about, again, patterns, trends, friction points, things like that. We connect for the week like that. And then from 10 to 12, we have the leadership team meeting where Andy, Justin and Holly, the two production managers, Estimator and me all get together in the war room and we go through my very succinct, uh, very specific list of uh, our leadership team meeting where we go through the job costing, we go through our baselines, we talk about issues in the company, we check in on the rocks, on the goals for each person, and then we talk about very specific things. We IDS, identify, discuss, and solve. So we identify things that need to be solved, we discuss them, we make solutions, we assign it to somebody, and then we move on for the day. And then typically in uh, Monday afternoons, it's a lot of catch up because when I take myself out for a whole morning of meetings like that, um, there's just uh, stuff accumulates and you need to, you know, kind of go through that. Typically Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, same morning routine, but I usually try to get out into the field to either coach, mentor, visit something, just circulate around, looking at the job sites, maintaining the SOPs, stuff like that. Uh, and then, uh, you know, typically the lunch and then the afternoon, I, I catch up again, uh, do some business development. Uh, the green blocks you see in the afternoon are kind of uh, things that I call business development, which are if there's emails to be answered, uh, estimates to be adjusted, uh, issues from painters in the field, we take care of that. And then I start working on the things that need to be done for the business. So again, I spend a lot of time going over financials, maintaining those, main, maintaining a cash flow, checking up on accounts receivable. And then just corresponding, you know, there's a lot of big accounts and big relationships that I manage through the business. And yeah, that's what I kind of do in the afternoon. And I always spend a little bit of time, probably 10 minutes, 15 minutes every hour, just maintaining, looking at Slack, looking at the leadership team, corresponding, like getting, getting all the things done there. And then every day between four and five, at the end of the day, I like to do a little bit of ideation where I find it very valuable to force myself to stop and think. If your whole day is spent reacting to text messages, to calls, to emails, to this and that, your brain never takes three seconds to start the logical thinking steps. When I take that morning ideation walk, you're forcing yourself not to look at a screen, not to have a pencil, not to have a phone in your hand. And your brain is taking the many, many steps that it wouldn't take in logic that when you're just locked into all this reaction, your brain can't take time to just sink in and do a deep thought once in a while. So for me, I like to decompress at the end of the day. I like to think about what's happened. And again, I look for patterns and, and things that need to be addressed in the company like that. Th basically, Tuesday and Wednesday, the same. Uh, Thursday, uh, I give a company update. Sometimes we do a virtual meeting uh, via Google Meets. Uh, sometimes we just put something out on Slack as a list of, hey, here's what's going on in the company. Here's the next happy hour. Here's the next crass person meeting. Um, we reserve an optional production meeting uh, Thursday midday in case the production managers need it. Typically, we, we do this when there's a whole bunch of schedule changes or a lot of times during the summer when the weather hits um, and there's changes all the time. We'll reserve that Thursday for, OK, quick, let's all meet in the war room again. Let's talk about schedule before everybody breaks for the day. And then Thursday, uh, 11 to 12, I do a boss lunch every week. So I typically go to the most advantageous job site, try to hit everybody every once in a while, bring lunch. The whole leadership team is there and we talk about the job. We talk about personal stuff, whatever, but it's kind of fun to just bring lunch, all sit around uh, and then just kind of talk like that. Uh, and then again, uh, afternoons, uh, kind of ideation. And then Friday morning when I get up, I usually keep the same morning routine to catch up in the fitness. And then it's basically like pet projects like I want to do, like 
doing visioning spreadsheets where you're doing thought experiments and you're and you're trying out new things or maybe we're going to reform our safety plan so I dig around for content and put it all together you know just things pet projects that I like to do so all right let's go through another couple questions here how many hours do you sleep I feel like you're max six hours so I actually get at least seven hours so I go uh yeah, 9 p.m. to 4 a.m., give or take seven hours. And it doesn't mean you're not tired, but, uh, you know, it just I feel like everybody's got their own rhythm. I envy those people who can get six hours, five hours and keep going. Most people don't. And I'm not one of those people who like, oh, I don't need any sleep, this and that. No, everybody needs sleep. I find myself, you know, back in the days when I used to just really, really overwork myself. Um, I find that when I start getting tired, I notice those signs as my back start, my lower back starts getting weak. Like you find your posture kind of going weird and your back gets a little sore. And then you start losing interest a little bit in what you're doing. You're maybe not as fresh, not as thoughtful, not as intentional as you were at six or seven in the morning. And that to me is a sign of like, I can grit through and do that, but that's tough. You don't want to do that all the time. So, all right, let's go through some Facebook messages here. Do, 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 do. Brian Chemnitz, seven to five is only 10 hours. How do you account for breaks and lunch? In other words, you're actually getting 10 hours of production or it's less. So again, think about it. If you have a five-day work week, you're having five lunches, a break in the morning, a break in the afternoon. You're having 10 breaks. For a four-day work week, you're having eight breaks in a week and you're having four lunches in a week. Every company does this just because we do a four day work week doesn't mean that people don't take breaks and lunches. If you think about it, we actually take less time off than people who work a four day work week. We're still doing 40 hours, but there's only eight breaks, eight 15 minute breaks and four lunches instead of 10 breaks and five lunches in there. So, yeah, it is what it is uh, in a in an eight hour work day. You're actually getting, you know, tech technically you legally where I'm from, you have to give them access, you know, a break in the morning, break in the afternoon and a lunch like that. So really in an eight hour day, theoretically, there's an hour where people aren't working in, uh, in my business on a four day work week, they're working 10 hours with an hour that they're not working. So there's nine hours of production each day. So we're actually getting more production out of 40 hours than a, uh, than a five day work week. So Jonathan LaFontaine, we're experiencing a construction boom, Madison, Wisconsin. The contractors are working subs without contracts and paying them what they want at the end. It's a mess. You don't have to mess around in that world. So um, it's tougher to build a client base from residential repaints. But when you do, you're completely free of general contractors and things like that. And now general contractors are OK. A lot of them are fine, but a lot of them will grind you to a pulp and you don't have to do it because there is an insane amount of work out there from private clients who will value you. You can gain their trust. You can, you can work in their homes and you're not going to be under the gun of general contractors. So we work for general contractors, but it's a select few that share our core values and don't chew us up like a meat grater. So Scotty Frayne, self-reflection is so important. Well said, well said. <laughs> Kevin Hayes, same here. When I work too much, my lower back lets me know. Absolutely. Does your wife have any involvement with the company? Does she like the four-day work week that you have? My wife does not have involvement with the company. We're very intentional about that. Uh, years and years ago, we had lots of discussions about, do you want to be a part of this? Do you not? Um, I'll get rid of my schedule here. Um, I have a lot of data points on this stuff. Uh, I respect uh, I respect her decision with that because I came from the worst version of a family business where my father worked me like a dog. Saturdays, Sundays, evenings, every holiday, every weekend, all that stuff. And uh, that's how I grew up. And that was my base of knowledge. And I had to reform myself over the years. My wife had a big hand in that saying, you need to be around evenings and weekends. You need to do this. And at first I pushed back. But then after you did it, you realize it's a much wiser way to go. My father also forced my mother to work in the business, forces her to do all the book work, do a lot of that stuff. He even forced her to paint. Uh, she would, it was a very, very regressive sort of work-life relationship because my father, what he did very poorly was guilt his family into working. And that's not something an employer can do with a stranger or an employee because they don't have that father-son uh, spouse relationship. So it's a very, very toxic thing to do. Um, so we had a very intentional discussion whether my wife wanted to be involved in the business or not. She did not. 
I'm glad for her. She was a school teacher. She now stays home with our kids. She has arguably sometimes more to do than I do in, in most work weeks. Um, my father had this thing where he would push my mother away from the business, have her get a real job somewhere, and then he would get overwhelmed with work, make her quit her job, and rejoin the business and do manual labor. And uh, my mother is an amazing, amazing wallpaper hanger, painter, craftsperson, but that's not the way that it should be done. Uh, it's, uh, it's the way that I was raised in it and it gave me a sour taste in it and I will not repeat that sort of thing. So, yeah. All right, folks, I think that's about it. Uh, I will be monitoring this afterwards in case you guys have any questions, but this is the four day work week. I would, I would urge you guys not to, I mean, this is, this is not for everybody. It's fine. It's a novel idea. There's some things, there's lots of pluses, a few minuses that come with it, but the four day work week for me is a way of first principle reasoning. When everybody says, this is the way we've always done it. We've always used that primer. We've always used that brush. We've always used that truck. We've always estimated this way. We've always marketed this way. We've always worked five days a week. That to me is ripe for innovation. I would, I would urge every single one of you big thinkers to take a couple steps back from your business. And if there are any things in your business that are, we've always done it this way, I would attack that. I would first principle reason it, which is basically get rid of your assumptions. If you can say it can't be done, stop it. Can it? There's nothing stopping you from doing most of these things. It's just this head trash that we all have. Boil it down to the basic fundamental truths. And there is a fly buzzing around me. Uh, boil it down to the basic fundamental truths. Look at those fundamental truths and then reason up from there. What is stopping you from doing a lot of the things you want to be doing? It's mainly us. And it's mainly a head trash, this assumption that we had. What stops you from having enough time to taking care of yourself, fitness and, and diet wise? What stops you from having enough family time? What stops you from doing 30 estimates a week? What stops you from hiring people? Well, there's no good people out there. There's not one good person in this entire universe that you can find. I live in a town of 8,000 people. There's not one good person in that town you can find to work for you mainly head trash. So anyway, I get, <laughs> I get pushy with that stuff because those are the things that I dwelled in for most of my professional life. I wasted a lot of years not doing these things sooner. I do not want the same for you guys. So I would say right now, attack those things. First principle reasoning. We've always done it this way. Look for those and start finding ways to innovate. This industry, the trades, not just painters, the trades as a whole needs you guys to do this stuff. We are not going to recruit the best and the brightest, the big thinkers, the innovators, the changers, if we do everything the way that things were always done. So one more question. Legendary painting. How did you break the cycle from the bad taste you had in your dad's company? <laughs> First principle reasoning. I made a list of all the things that were horrible about myself, and I started working on them intentionally to fix them. Now, I would, I would never tell you that that is, list is complete and the success, but again, we've always done it this way. My father drove a half ton pickup truck everywhere he went. So what did I do when I started my business? Half ton pickup truck. Pretty soon you realize, why am I driving around a $38,000 truck? I can't even fit a sheet of plywood in the back. So I bought a $9,000 van. I can put a sheet of plywood in the back. I can carry all the tools I need. I can put eight extension ladders on top. Cheaper to buy, cheaper to run. Why do we use pickup trucks? I'm not hauling anything. What are we doing? First principle of reasoning. I got rid of a lot of that stuff by having accountability partners and having people call me out on my BS, honestly. Pretty soon you look around. I had somebody tell me, one, <laughs> this, is, this is the stupidest, simplest thing, but it is most effective. I have an accountability partner where I was listing out things that just consume my time. I was like, I can't. This is a burning feeling. It's just like I think about it all day and night. And they're like, what are you doing about it? I'm like, well, I mean, I don't have time to do it. I, 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 all I do is think about it. It's like, if you think about something that much, you should probably do something about it. That one statement that somebody gave me like that shamed me into changing lots of things about myself. If you think about this that much, why aren't you doing something about it? There's no good people out there. I want to hire. I want to see what that's like. I want to hire my first employee. Just do it. Just do it. Stop thinking about it. Just do it. If you think about it so much, why don't you do anything for it? action is the key. So thank you guys. I absolutely love this. Uh, thanks for the Saturday morning stuff. 
And uh, God, PCA, if you want more of this, <laughs> if you want a group of people to call you out on your head trash and push you and do first principle reasoning, look to the PCA, the Painting Contractors Association. I have a list of dates uh, that I'll be traveling the country now, uh, starting in May, uh, on the Ask a Painter Live website uh, or Facebook page. So get there. Uh, look at those. If you want me in your area, contact me, contact the PCA, uh, and we can line something up. Uh, we can line up underwriters. We can line up a place. We can do all that stuff. I want to come visit people. I want to share my master's classes, and I want to learn from you guys as well. So look for some fun events coming up. Uh, we're, we're just forming a Northeast tour. So two years ago, if you guys remember, I did the Vermont, the New Jersey, the New York, the this, the Boston, the this and that. We are creating that once again. So look forward to that. And everybody else, have a great weekend, and we will see you later.